Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the Harassus USA meeting for 2022. My name is Scott Mordell, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's meeting and today's session. We appreciate you starting with this session, the kickoff, Managing the U.S. National Debt. This topic was framed in the materials as one ought not to live beyond one's means. Yet through 2020 and 2021, the need to control the COVID pandemic and consequences has seen huge debt accumulation. Why? In the USA, the richest nation of the world, does it have difficulty in setting its debt ceiling? Could it manage this in any way that, is not, that does not worry media pundits, investors, and business leaders alike? And we have a fantastic panel for the topic today. Ryan Bourne is the chair for the Public Understanding of Economics at Cato, current columnist for the Daily Telegraph, and author of the recent book of Economics in One Virus. Ryan has written on numerous economic issues, including fiscal policy, inequality, minimum wages, infrastructure spending, the cost of living, and rent controls. Paul Sheard is research fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. He has previously held chief economist positions at Lehman Brothers, Nomura Securities, Standard & Poor's Rating Services, and S&P Global. Paul is a veteran central bank and markets economist who has written and spoken widely on QE and unconventional monetary policies. Stuart Eisenstadt heads the international practice for legal counsel Covington and Berlin. Stuart held a number of key senior positions across three United States administrations, including Chief White House Domestic Policy Advisor, U.S. Ambassador to the European Union, Under Secretary of Commerce for International Trade, Under Secretary of State for Economic, Business, and Agricultural Affairs, and Deputy Secretary of the Treasury. So, we want, thank you for being here, gentlemen. We truly appreciate. Uh, uh, very honored to have you come to this topic. All of these gentlemen have much longer bios and much more accomplishments. They're so highly accomplished. Um, you can read more about them in the uh, Harassus event materials. We'd encourage you to do that. But we're going to open the session with uh, some questions and discussion, and then we'll open it up uh, and we welcome any questions that you may have in the audience. Um, just type into the chat or, or the question button and we'll, we'll accommodate them if, if, as we can along the way. So, Let's get started. It's difficult for governments to add debts in acute crises, and many governments increase national spending as an added debt in managing the pandemic. There are so many worries in the world for leaders right now. Sample issues include Ukraine, geopolitical trends, rising distinctions of the U.S. and China economic spheres, inflation, price of oil and energy, uh, supply chain evolutions, post-COVID pandemic evolution, and I could go on and on. So really, the question to kick us off is, where does the U.S. debt load rank among the concerns for the future, in your view? And Stu, uh, let's get started with you, if we would. Scott, thank you. And it's an honor to be on this panel with Paul and Ryan. Uh, two, you were really exploring two questions. First, has the U.S. debt reached dangerous territory, which threatens our economic growth and well-being? My answer is not yet. But as we approach a debt limit of 100% of our GDP, with likely increases in the decades ahead, it's getting time to get serious about addressing it. And second, is the way in which we deal with the debt limit rational? The answer is a resounding no. It's destabilizing. To an extent, we're all prisoners of our past experiences. I've served under many presidents, but two in particular, Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton, were serious about deficits and debts. And yet there's no clear correlation between low deficits and good economic performance. We had low deficits in the Carter administration, but very mediocre economic performance. We had low deficits, and indeed, when I was Deputy Treasury Secretary, even surpluses in the Clinton administration. And we had a Goldilocks economy with high growth and low inflation. And we've had decent economic performance under Presidents like Obama and Trump with high deficits. I'm worried about the growing debt, not for today or tomorrow, because with the lingering impact of COVID and the Ukraine crisis, this is no time for budget austerity. We can borrow at very low interest rates. But before the Great Recession of 2007-2009, our debt was about 35% of GDP. It rose to 80% before the pandemic. It's now approaching 100%, a level not seen since World War II. By 2030, this forecast will be close to 120%, one of the largest in the developed world already. Because the U.S. dollar is the major reserve currency, 
and there's little risk of default. We have the luxury of doing this, but no one knows at what point that higher debt to our GDP growth will crowd out private sector investment, slow growth, require higher interest rates to encourage foreign investors, and lead to higher inflation. We say with some confidence that the higher it goes, the greater the risk. The Congressional Budget Office projects, for example, that the U.S. debt could be twice the size of our GDP by 2050 unless actions are taken with higher interest rates, and by 2034, Social Security may be insolvent. This rapid increase in the U.S. debt is not sustainable. We'll have an increasingly elderly population, fewer workers to support them, and greater demands on entitlements. The second question, Scott, is the debt limit. The way we deal with raising the debt limit is close to lunacy. There is a major misunderstanding about the debt limit and the consequences of raising it. We had no debt limit at all until 1917 during World War I, and we remain one of the few industrial democracies in the world with a debt limit. Indeed, the only other major Western industrial democracy to have one is Denmark. Raising the debt limit does not authorize more spending. Congress is simply allowing the Treasury to pay for past expenditures that Congress has already made to avoid a catastrophic default and maintain the full faith and credit of the government. It should be routine, but it's become a political football to embarrass the president of the opposing party and has come close to bringing the U.S. to near default in recent years. Let me close by suggesting several ways to avoid this dangerous brinksmanship on the debt limit. First, we could scrap it entirely. Again, we're the only industrial democracy except Denmark with one. Second, we could tie the debt limit to each spending bill that Congress passes, so at least there's a recognition that the debt is going up as we spend more. Third, a way I prefer is combining raising the debt limit with reforms to limit future fiscal deficits. So Congress is forced to confront whether raising borrowing levels is sustainable, while at the same time avoiding costly debt ceiling showdowns. Congress did this in 2019, raising the debt limit for two years as part of a bipartisan budget deal. Just a few days ago, a bipartisan group of 24 members of the House proposed what they call the Responsible Budgeting Act. It gives Congress two options. First would be pass a budget resolution that achieves a specific debt reduction measure, while simultaneously passing a joint resolution, suspending the debt limit until the next fiscal year. Second, if Congress fails to pass this budget resolution, the president would be allowed on his own or her own to suspend the debt limit, which Congress could then override within 30 days. This at least would bring some sense to the debt limit. Thank you, and I look forward to hearing from my fellow panelists. Thank you very much, Stu. Very very helpful. Um, If uh, Um, if, uh, just encourage everybody to go on mute uh, if you can. Um, I'm not speaking, but I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it over to uh, um, uh, uh, Ryan right now, Um, uh, um, and and just really to the same question, uh, Ryan, which is uh, uh, where does the debt U.S. debt load rank among the uh, concerns for the future? Well, thank you. And thank you to Horasis for inviting me to speak again today. Um, I pretty much agree with about 80% of what Stuart just said. Um, and perhaps we can get into some of the disagreements later on, particularly around um, around the costs and benefits of the debt limit. Um, I think that the national debt outlook in the US is a potential major concern in future. Um, I agree with Stuart that when a massive unforeseen shock to the economy like a pandemic or perhaps a war hits, Uh, Good economics does indeed say that you should let government debt act as a sort of shock absorber by not trying to balance the books straight away. Um, That laxity, in fact, means we can spread the costs of these unforeseen exogenous shocks, as we call them as economists, over taxpayers for future generations. And I think it's appropriate to do that. So while I think some aspects of the recent stimulus bills went far too far and actually in, in many ways undermined the recovery, or fueled the current inflation. I'm not as anxious about the 20% plus of GDP of public debt accumulated uh, during this crisis. I think allowing debt to take up that slack means we avoid having to jack up tax rates or make uh, spending volatile. 
uh, we can kind of smooth the the fiscal path. And for now, as you say, people seem to be willing to lend uh, to the Feds at relatively low rates. What really worries me is that the US government was already running an unprecedented deficit for peacetime going into this crisis, uh, just under 5% uh, of GDP, which is really unprecedented um, for after long periods without a recession. And I think that highlights a complete unwillingness uh, on behalf of the federal government to fund its current consumption and transfers. On top of that, we have an aging population, which interacting with the promises made through Social Security and Medicare means the outlook for debt in future generations is really unprecedented. Um, those entrenched deficits, um, if we don't meet them with um, much higher taxes or, or vast, drastic cuts to other de- uh, discretionary spending, would lead to an uplift in interest uh, spending. And so, uh, uh, as Stuart highlighted, the CBO's central estimate, central estimate on relatively cautious assumptions is that without action, debt would rise over the next 30 years to about double um, its current level, about 200% of GDP by 2051. Now, I think this does matter. I think the dynamics are such that even if um, in that scenario, interest rates remain low. The debt financing burden will continue to rise because we'd be significantly um, adding to the debt. Unlike when we've had previous periods of high debt, there are no easy solutions um, to this outlook. You can't inflate away index linked social security promises or real healthcare demands. Um, in previous periods, we've had uh, politicians committed to balancing uh, the budget in primary, um, in primary terms, the primary balance. We don't have that at the moment. The tax hikes necessary to reduce the debt burden, I think, would have uh, big effects on incentives to work, produce and invest. And and the longer we put off um, taking that corrective action, uh, the bigger the the impact that those will have. So debt, I think, is a manifestation uh, of a spending problem that itself will cause economic uh, pain down the line. I often hear people kind of dismiss this concern and say, well, with uh, borrowing rates so low, we can borrow for all this kind of productive investment that actually will will boost the economy. Well, we're not doing that. Um, Mm -hmm. The actual outlook is determined by uh, fiscal transfers that we've promised in the form of Social Security and Medicare payments. I do not believe that those will enhance uh, fundamentally the productive potential of the economy, uh, which is assumed by the CBO and most other serious forecasters to be uh, weakening over the next uh, few decades. Now, there is a worry um, that continue to build up this debt And you heighten the risk of the day when the bond investors conclude repayment is unlikely. Um, Of course, we don't have that issue um, at the moment. But, you know, Greece was borrowing at relatively low rates until it wasn't. Um, You have all sorts of envisage all sorts of unforeseen crises that might hit and and make people fundamentally reassess whether the U.S. will be be good on its promises to repay its debts Um, if um, Bond investors then believe that they start to raise rates that they're willing to lend at, and at that stage you either you know have to see some form of default, an effective default on on citizens by uh, programs just stopping or being fundamentally scaled down, or a si- significant burst of the inflation tax, which as we're learning uh, at the moment doesn't seem to be particularly popular. Uh, means of reducing the real value of debts um, either. Now, of course, as I emphasize we don't face these problems yet um, but our heightening debts uh, through this crisis yes but mainly the outlook over the coming decades do raise the risk at least of um, of these sorts of scenarios and if the past three years has, has taught us anything I think it's not to rule out unforeseen um, edge cases and to be ready and resilient for completely uh, unexpected events. Thank you, Ryan. That's some f- fantastic comprehensiveness. And uh, um, I'd like to bring it over to Paul. I think Paul's got some uh, different perspectives and uh, I'm just uh, going to color that up. So thank you, Paul. You're on, you're on mute, Paul. Thank you there very much. Go. That's amazing. <laughs> After two years of Zoom yeah. calls, you know, <laughs> can you believe it? Um, Yes. Yeah, so thanks very much. Um, yeah, I do have a, I do have a, a kind of a, a, a different view um, on uh, on this issue of managing the U.S. debt. Um, mm-hmm. 
uh, which is you know, not to say that you know budgeting is not important. You know, we're talking about what is the government debt? I mean, it's the accumulation of prior uh, budget deficits. What are budget deficits? What's the difference between uh, how much money the the government injecting into the economy through its government spending? And spending takes two forms, which we very rarely actually distinguish. One is the direct government spending that influences GDP, government consumption and government investment. And then the transfers, social security, unemployment, uh, all kinds of, of transfers that the government is making, which is really more of a kind of a safety net and redistribution um, uh, uh, kind of thing. So, you know, the government deficit is an important uh, kind of variable. It tells you a lot about um, do you like a small government? Do you like a big government? Do you like a lot of redistribution? Uh, are you using the tax system, which is one half of the budget deficit and therefore one half of what gets you to the accumulating uh, government debt levels? Are you using the tax system uh, proactively or less proactively? Proactively in terms of correcting for externalities, giving subsidies to particular sectors, um, that is sort of steering the economy in a more interventionist way. So, you know, that simple variable, and, and then of course you have the macroeconomic um, sort of shock absorber uh, function of the government debt, which has been referred to. So, you know, as a as a as a as a as a policy topic and issue. Uh, the budget deficit and therefore the accumulated government debt, you know, it tells you an awful lot about the, the economy and policy. And there's a lot when you unpack that that you can discuss. But in my view, and certainly my perspective is I, I don't stay awake at night worrying about uh, that debt crisis and how to manage the debt. And, 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 and I don't even think that um, managing the debt is the right way to think about or frame the question. I mean, it's nice way of framing a panel and we do this mm -hmm. all the time but the government debt uh is not a policy uh target it's more of a sort of a a, a, a complicated policy tool if you like mm -hmm. um so it really again again comes back to these questions about you know what is your view on the role of the government taxation system etc cetera, etc cetera, rather than we should be aiming for a balanced budget or we should be aiming for a budget of a, of a certain size or not so you know from from that point of view sort of philosophical or conceptual point of view um you know it's it's I'm not too worried. It's sort of basically worrying about one side of the balance sheet and ignoring the the other. Um, just a couple of other reasons, perhaps, why I'm not kind of worried, just to, to help frame things. Um, even if I was sort of viewing it in more conventional terms, um, you know, the financial, uh, sorry, the financial crisis, Freudian slip, I was, you know, the, the core front of that process with the Lehman Brothers uh, experience. But now we had the COVID shock. And every time we have one of these major shocks, we get a, a ratcheting up of the, of the budget deficits and the, and the debt level. Um, but even with that tremendous uh, increment to government debt in 2020 and 21, which was driven by the biggest economic collapse in recorded history, a 10% fall in GDP in just two quarters, 11 percentage point rise in unemployment rate just in two months. So this was catastrophic stuff from the viewpoint of managing GDP rather than managing the debt. We got that big increase in budget deficits. Um, but where are we now? The, just to review the numbers here very, very quickly, Scott, um, you know, recently the 30 trillion number, uh, the $30 trillion number is a lot of attention because that was the sort of the debt level, um, broke through the $30 trillion level. But you have to take out about $7 trillion or so of that for debt which is held within the federal government. So that actually brings this debt to GDP ratio down from about 120% to about 96, 97%. But the Fed, this is a complicated discussion, but the Fed holds a big chunk of that debt, which is essentially refinanced into central bank reserves. Central bank reserves, by just their nature, can never default. I'm not saying we should ignore that, uh, that kind of consolidated government liability. But again, it takes the government debt level down now to about 70% of GDP. Um, and then you have to sort of ask questions about, well, what does that actually mean? And does that money ever actually have to get repaid? And perhaps we can discuss this later on. The answer is no, it actually never has to be repaid in the sense that we think about debt being repaid at the corporate or the household level. So again, that's the second reason. Third level, um, just very quickly, 
uh, and picking up on the point of Ryan's, which I think is, you know, is, is a valid point. But I think we do have about the markets. We do. Um, it's not an it's not an excuse to be so sort of totally permanently complacent. But we do have to pay, I think, a lot of attention to what markets are signalling. And as we're sitting here today, with all of this debt piling up and all of this discussion about deficits, 10-year Treasury yields are yielding below 2%. Now, there's a little bit of flight to quality with the, the Ukraine situation, but even so, they're around about 2%. 30-year Treasury yields, about 2.2%, 2.3%. Um, if you correct for inflation, they are real yields at which the government is borrowing, if you use that term. I would not necessarily agree with the term itself in this context, but if you use that conventional term, the government at a 30-year horizon is borrowing at close, able to borrow at close to a zero real interest rate. And the markets know everything about what we know. Again, footnote is markets don't always get it right. You can have bubbles and bubbles burst and hurting and everything else. But nonetheless, I think it is a significant message uh, that we have to, uh, you know, keep keep listening to to a certain extent. Let me leave it there for the moment. Thank you. Uh, very well done. Uh, um, and appreciate that. So uh, just to, to, to go back to uh, um, just for, for some of the commentary there for, uh, um, for, for, for Stu and, and Ryan, especially, um, you know, Relative to what you've heard from Paul, um, you know, how do you think about the challenges of the debt levels for for, for government and uh, the business and economy overall? So, um, do, you, do you have any uh, perspectives in that regard? So, uh, let, let's start with Stu. Yes, well, I think it was a very interesting and provocative uh, mm -hmm. uh, intervention uh, by Paul, and I read some of his uh, uh, writings, and of course, he has great experience as well. Uh, I think that one could all agree that as we get to an aging population with declining birth rates, with massive increased demands on Social Security, on Medicare, on Medicaid, as our defense spending now with Ukraine will almost inevitably have to get up, uh, with uh, a allergy to raising taxes to anything like OECD levels, that the debt levels will definitely increase over years uh, ahead. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to default, but it does mean, it seems to me, that we have a situation in which there'll be more pressure on, uh, on interest rates uh, and there will be a ballooning of federal deficits and accumulated debt that at some point, uh, is going to affect economic growth. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to lead to a depression, mm -hmm. but it does seem to me that it will mean lower growth. You just can't indefinitely have transfer payments. And by the way, one of the things uh, that I would add to this is, uh, Paul, the question of what type of spending. It's one thing to spend on transfer payments, it's another thing to spend on investments, on infrastructure, on innovation, uh, on things that make us more competitive. And we don't really segregate those uh, at all. At all. Uh, so uh, I think that it is important that we also look at the quality of the spending that we're doing, not just the amount that we're doing. Thank you, Stu. Uh, uh, Ryan? Comment to that? Just finding the button. There you go. Fin finally, find the uh, <laughs> the unmute button. Um, <laughs> look, I, th I think I think Paul is right to emphasise that there's no right level of government debt. You know, economists have thought about this a lot. There was a famous debate a few years ago where some economists, some big name economists, seemed to suggest that if the debt level raised above ninety percent of GDP, all hell would break loose. And clearly, we haven't. Uh, seen that. So economists are really grappling with this question at the moment. And of course, if you're thinking about an infinite time horizon in which, um, you know, we do uh, repay or grow our way out of some uplift in, in debt in the long run, um, if you put aside all the redistributive effects that that in itself has, of course, um, 
uh, running up debt has um, implications for future generations of taxpayers, then yes, you know, debt creates an asset and the liability. It's a bit like if you buy a house, you're borrowing for spending today and then paying back in future. So why do why do I think it's more interesting or perhaps um, worrisome than Paul? You know, the first the first point is I think there is a risk that uh, at some point that people investors will look at the forward looking imbalance between spending commitments and revenues, and that will be so large that that they'll adjust uh, their faith in the U.S.'s ability to pay. Uh, as I say, we don't know when when that would be. A confidence equilibria are not something that economists um, know much about, as the past few years have kind of uh, have told us. And um, you know. And some, sometimes people accuse uh, people like me in this debate of trusting every market but the bond market, which I think is what uh, <laughs> Paul was alluding to. And I, I take that critique, but I also, you know, acknowledge the fact that just prior to COVID, the US was ranked as the, the the country best prepared in terms of being ready for a pandemic. So, you know, I think we have to think about tail risk. The second point, though, is really a pure economics point, which is that the um, the debt does represent big increases uh, coming in government spending. Um, and as Stuart said, looking at the desirability of that borrowing requires understanding what it's being used for. Um, uh, and I think a lot of people get the economics of this wrong. They say, well, because the government is able to borrow relatively cheaply at the moment, um, you know, the, the we should do so because the, the, the benefits will almost certainly uh, exceed the cost. And I think that's the wrong threshold to thinking about what the government should be doing. The threshold should be whether the, the net social returns of that activity would exceed the net social returns of the funds and the resources, not just funds, but the, you know, the, the people, the machinery and everything else that's used um, in the government program, whether that would be better off. Uh, left in the private sector uh, of the economy. And as Stuart made clear in his opening remarks, you know, if debt and borrowing per se was so great for growth, then we'd be enjoying the, fu- the fruits of, uh, of the borrowing we've seen over the last uh, couple of decades now. I'm not convinced that, uh, that borrowing uh, per se has any real relationship uh, with, with economic uh, growth. So I don't see the kind of positive case there that perhaps uh, many other people allude to when they talk about this question. Scott, now you're on mute. Well, we're three for four. So uh, <laughs> here we go. So uh, um, th- thank you, Ryan. Uh, Paul, is there anything you'd like to share to that before we, we shift the, uh, the discussion a bit? Um, no, I think I would, I, you know, yeah. to, I would kind of picking up on, on maybe one, one of the both points or two points, one from Stu and one from, from Ryan, um, mm-hmm. point of agreement with Stu there, and as kind of alluded to this is that in, in all of this debate, we do not distinguish between t- two kinds of government spending. And I, it, you know, every time I hear that word, I say, what kind of spending are we talking about here? As an economist, I tend first and foremost to think in terms of GDP and economic activity. And if you like, the call on resources and the extent to which this government spending is helping uh, economic growth. And the, the sort of well, the kind of surprising thing is that even the, the, the episode we just went through, the two year episode, particularly 2021, um, the, all of that government spending had very little impact directly on GDP. It wasn't about that. If you look at the contribution, for example, of government spending, that's government consumption, government investment, to GDP growth over that period, over the two-year period, it was something like 0.2 percentage points. And if you looked at the prior uh, equivalent period, it was actually higher in that prior period. So this wasn't about direct government spending that was driving GDP, but it was very much about uh, the government essentially printing a lot of money, creating a lot of money and handing it out. And, you know, we go into a long discussion about it's a different topic. You know, was that good economic policy? Did they go too far? A little bit in, in Ryan's camp there that, you know, we're now looking at inflation five, six, seven percent. So it looks like we've got too much money chasing too few goods at the moment. So kind of overspend a little bit there. But um, it's that kind of government spending is, is very, very different um, from from the other. In terms of the the, the, the sort of issue that's come about the aging of the population and uh, all of the sort of the mounting contingent liabilities. Again, at the risk of sounding too blasé and sort of complacent about this, 
I sort of view that in terms of, you know, government is one giant social contract and society sort of makes these, we're all in it together. You know, we, we make all these promises to ourselves and then it's our job over time to meet those promises. And in some sense, this default issue is about, you know, how good are those promises that we're making to ourselves and to ourselves in the future? And you could call them future generations. But those promises are going to be on the future generations to, uh, to, to deliver to their own generation, in a sense. So it's not quite as intergenerational as it looks. But the big question is, um, it's a race between, if you like, productivity and innovation. Uh, and and the promises we're making, the texts that we're kind of writing. And I guess I'm a little bit more, um, even though that we do have this productivity puzzle that economists worry about, where is this productivity? You know, w- we see it in our pocket. We see it with our <laughs> smartphones. We mm-hmm. see it with the medical technology that's being developed. We see it all around the place. We just don't see it in the productivity statistics. But I guess I'm a little bit more... Um, confident, optimistic about the ability over 10, 20, 50 year time horizon for us to generate the technology improvements to actually meet those promises. But it is a race between the promises and the productivity. And in some sense, if I'm wrong and we run into roadblocks down the road, we can to a certain extent and we'll have to cross those bridges when we come to them. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Stu? Yes. So uh, one thing that we haven't talked about Mm-hmm. Is as much as we might is inflation and whether there's any relationship between levels of deficits and debt and inflation. Uh, let me, however, go to the transfer issue with Social Security and Medicare. It, Paul, it's just it, it's just uh, clear as we live longer lives into the 80s, into the 90s, and we have fewer and fewer workers supporting that. The burden of supporting those entitlement programs is going to grow enormously and it's already taking away from the investment side of the federal budget uh you know we have less and less for discretionary spending Mm -hmm. for research and development for things that can increase productivity and more and more for simple transfer payments so that's one problem the second is on inflation expectations and here, again, um, I lost my job in, in part in the 1980 election because of the Iran hostage crisis, but also because of double-digit inflation. Now, mind you, we had low-budget deficits. But there is an issue, I think, of whether inflationary expectations with the big stimulus that we've had in 2020, 2021, 2022 can fuel inflationary expectations. And that's something I think it's worth at least talking about. And if we measure those inflation expectations by high budget deficits, it may feed into a loop of inflationary expectations. Thank you. And leave the Fed to have to do what it's doing now, which is raise interest rates. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Ryan, do you want to comment relative to inflation specifically? You touched on it previously, but uh, just relative to the question. Yeah. um, Yeah. My model of this uh, seems quite quaint now because I I kind of uh, take the the kind of more traditional line that, of course, the government, um, the government does directly uh, influence the price level through the interaction of monetary and fiscal policy, what we describe as a macroeconomic policy. I think that monetary policy is the key driver of that in normal times. But when interest rates um, get extremely low, then um, fisc- fiscal policy sometimes is not kind of crowded out by by um, a monetary offset. So I agree with Stuart that I think what's happened over the past year, we've had vast uh, macroeconomic, not stimulus, I think, um, as Paul said, uh, most of it was actually relief spending. So it was kind of like an indirect stimulus because it boosted mm-hmm. people's um, disposable incomes. Uh, but we've seen um, a macroeconomic expansion uh, that went far beyond um, a macroeconomic stimulus that went far beyond because of the pandemic, the productive capacities of the economy to provide the goods and services that people um, would would demand. And People argue about whether it was primarily the demand side or the supply side that caused this inflation, which to me is a bit like arguing over which blade of the scissors cut the paper. If um, it, it either shows that the uh, the Fed had an in, inaccurate view of, of what the um, 
supply potential of the economy was, um, or it suggests to me that actually the the Fed um, isn't as interested in inflation, but it's actually targeting something a bit different, perhaps something like nominal um, GDP instead. But I, I agree with Stuart. I think um, I think in the near term there is. I don't really believe in wage price spirals uh, as such. And um, I think the Fed has the ability to choke off um, inflation pretty quickly over over a couple of years if it wants to. Um, but I think in the near term, you are going to see the pass through of some of these uplifts in, in, in prices of inputted goods. Um, and uh, you're going to see demands for, for higher wages for those on relatively fixed contracts and as they renegotiate their contracts. And that leads to all sorts of um, relative problems in the economy, you know, uh, resources being in the wrong places, uh, misallocated workers. So inflation comes with a high cost. And there's a reason that we try traditionally to keep inflation at um, positive but steady low levels. And uh, and so I, I'm not really sure what my definitive conclusion is. But yeah, I think there are instances where big government deficits can contribute to an inflationary environment. Uh, and that tends to happen most often when we have unusual situations uh, like we saw in the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. And Paul, anything you'd like to speak to relative to rising inflation specifically? Yeah, yeah no, no. Um, and I think I think we're all kind of like, I think we're actually all getting a coalescing around sort of agreements. We're sort of mm -hmm. using different frameworks and, and, right. and some different language and we're sort of getting to the same place. Um, I, I, you know, I think on Stuart's point about the, the healthcare system, um, yeah, I mean, these are this, I mean, the healthcare system in the US and what to do about it and, and, you know, what sort of promises should we make? Um, and how do we, how do we sort of fund those, et cetera? That's the really important issue. So I guess in some sense, what I'm saying is, um, that's an, that's a question, a really important question about managing the healthcare system and managing the social contract around that. Um, it's not really about managing the debt, but managing the debt may be a good way of framing it and an entry point into that more micro structural uh, issue. So I'm not saying that's not important. I'm, I'm just saying that's sort of the question we should focus on. What sort of healthcare system do we want in the US? How do we manage it um, rather than obsessing about the debt level per se? It just it distracts in a sense, in my view. On the inflation issue, um, absolutely right. Um, that so the way again very simplistically i would look at it is i mean i view the government debt essentially in, in terms of it's an asset as well as a debt it's essentially money that the government has created and injected into the economy but then to a large extent kind of neutralized or sterilized by turning it into government debt securities treasuries which are things that look like they can default that's why we worry about the debt crisis. But I, unlike most economists, I actually, because economists don't view government debt, that is treasuries, treasuries as money. I do. I think we should view them as a different form of money. Mm -hmm. And so then the question is not, is it too much debt because we can't repay it, but rather have we created too big a stock of purchasing power that is, it could at some point be unleashed into the economy and then we would get too much uh, purchasing power, chasing too few goods, too little capacity to produce the goods. That's the way I think about it. Um, and that means what do you have, happens then? You get inflation. So then this, is, this isn't this is a question of, okay, then I think we have to start thinking more about uh, do, we have, do we have the right tools and framework for dealing with that issue when it comes? And of course, dealing with the, let's say in 10 years time, we get a really high inflation and we have to put the brakes on the monetary and fiscal side of things there will be sacrifices in terms of some people will not be uh, consuming either for consumption or investment purposes because there's just not enough resources to go around. And because of policies aimed at tackling high inflation, um, they're just, you know, this crowding out, call it whatever you like. Yes, they are real trade-offs we'll have to make. Um, but I would turn, I would sort of take the discussion a little bit in another direction and say, when we look at the US policy framework, we, it's a real kind of uh, dog's breakfast in terms of hmm. most fiscal policy makers, I don't think, are thinking that they have a role in terms of managing the deficit in order to modulate aggregate demand. And so whose job is it to control inflation? You know, one minute it seems it's the Fed's on paper, but then, you know, another day it turns out everyone's looking at the federal government and the budget, etc. 
The reality is, unlike many other countries, and there are good reasons for this separation of powers, etc., but the U.S. does not have a very kind of coherent and user-friendly framework for coordinating the aggregate demand management aspect of monetary and fiscal policy because of the independence of the Fed. It's almost anathema to have that discussion. But that's why I would take the discussion. I've written a little bit about this, that we need Mm -hmm. to perhaps uh, realize that at some point the Congress may have to step in and raise taxes, manage the deficit, manage the debt, not because they have to repay the money per se, that's not the right framework, but rather because they need to modulate, that is constrain and restrain aggregate demand and face up to the fact that there are trade-offs um, and um, you know, sort of own that and not just hoist it all over to the Fed and say, well, it's, you know, it's your job and you know, um, don't look at us. Thank you very, very much. Uh, we're running uh, tight on time, but I, I know Stu wants to make a, a, yeah, a quick comment we, here before I we wrap. I think we spent too little time talking about the debt limit hmm. uh, and the political football that it's become. And this will become, I think, in very high relief if the Republicans, as seems uh, possible, maybe likely, take over the Congress. And as we get to the debt limit issue again after the midterm elections, uh, there'll be tremendous pressure if there's a Republican Congress on basically saying to the president, we are not going to increase this debt limit again unless you put in place major deficit reduction measures, which would run totally contrary to the uh, desires of his base. So I think we're going to see this confrontation mm-hmm. coming sooner rather than later. Uh, and it gets to the point that we've made the debt limit instead of just a mechanical device, uh, which we have to raise uh, inevitably into a political football. Well framed. Well framed. Thank you. Uh, Ryan, you look like you want to make a comment to that. No? Yeah, yeah, I have mixed feelings about the debt ceiling. Um, Uh uh, To a certain extent, you know, ultimately has, in terms of constraining the debt, has become like a legal formality. I know we have all these political battles, but it has been... Um, acted on, uh, I believe, 78 times since 1960. So uh, clearly, if it were intended to stop the accumulation of debt, it, it's failed. Um, and I, I think most economists agree that it's daft to set a nominal uh, debt limit like that anyway, for all sorts of reasons, which I won't go into. But I will just emphasize is, is Stuart's point, which is that occasionally the debt limit has served a kind of instrumental purpose um, to bring attention to the impact of spending commitments. And as a result of um, as a result of the kind of standoff has led to uh, the, the imposition of kind of measures to reduce deficit. So since 1985, virtually every major deficit reduction law has actually been attached to a debt limit increase. Um, the 1985, 1987 uh, Graham and Hollings deficit caps were attached to debt limit bills. Um, I believe they were in 1990, 1993, 1997. Um, that contributed to uh, the 98 to 2001 balance budgets, um, uh, the 2011 Budget Control Act, and its uh, 2.1 trillion spending cut was attached to a debt limit bill. So I'm open in theory as an economist to learning from uh, other countries about better alternatives to the debt ceiling. Um, I really like the Swiss um, quite uh, flexible, adaptable balance budget uh, amendment that kind of caps the increase in debt, but in an economically um, uh, reasonable way that doesn't undermine some of the arguments Paul's made for kind of uh, managing the, or at least allowing the management of the business cycle. Um, So I'm open in theory to all of that, but I think abolishing the debt limit entirely with nothing to replace it you would perhaps um, get even less concern about the accumulation of debt than we've seen now, because there have been instances through history where the debt limit has led to a focus on um, on the need to constrain borrowing. Thank you, thank you very much. And we're 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 running up uh, running up on the limits of time. Unfortunately, this is such a broad topic with that uh, requires some deep understanding. It's uh, forty five minutes is a challenge. Uh, what, what I would like to ask is each of you if uh, uh, if you'd share the from your perspective, the biggest takeaway uh, um, or point of advice you would like to offer our attendees in the Harassus Visions community uh, coming out of our discussion. And, and Paul, uh, I'd love to start with you if that's okay. 
Yeah, sure. Thanks very much, Scott. And again, this has been a great, a great debate. I really enjoyed it and, and learned a lot. Um, yeah, I think my, just the, the one liner would be think about the government debt issue. Um, uh, don't think about it in terms of a household. Think about it in terms of, um, you know, the, 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 the broader you know, unpack it and look what's underneath. It's all about policy choices. It's all about how you run the economy. Uh, it's all about that stuff. It's a complicated issue. Don't think about it in terms of we've run up too much debt on our credit card. The, way, the, the sort of language that the politicians tend to use, again, it's a shorthand, but go beyond that. Um, there's a thing called fallacy of composition. It's just not the right way to think about it. It's more complicated, more in many ways, more interesting than that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Ryan, would you share a, a takeaway or point of advice for our audience? Yeah, I think my simple point would be that um, over the coming decades, we're going to experience unprecedented pressure on the federal finances, and I think that will make them more of a political issue. And, and unfortunately, history doesn't provide a great guide for how to navigate and deal with them, because a lot of the circumstances that occurred when we previously had uh, very high debt levels um, after World War II do not apply anymore. Will that be the growth outlook? Um, the, the potential to inflate away uh, some of the, the debt or the commitments on behalf of politicians to balance budgets. So it's going to be interesting times. Thank you very much. And uh, Stu, we'll finish with you. Two quick points. Uh, yeah. We don't need to feel that we're in a crisis mode, even though the de debt limit is, uh, the debt is going up, but we can't be complacent because of the demographic changes that are going to occur in an aging population. And second, we desperately need to reform the way in which we deal with the debt limit to, to remove the political football, uh, the uh, last minute uh, uh, deals that have to be made and combine it with some reasonable reforms so that when we raise the debt limit, we do make some uh, uh, significant reforms on the spending side. Thank you. Very powerful takeaways. Uh, I want to thank all. Thank you for participating so fully. I know we have so much left unsaid that we'd love to chat through and, and, and work our way through, but that maybe that'll be a, a, a future panel uh, and topic discussion for, for the community. So uh, with that, uh, this will conclude our discussion. It will be available via recording and video um, published uh, after this conference. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll wish everybody a great day and a, and a great rest of the conference. So, so bye for now. Thank you.